Welcome to Section 3 of Higher Education 573, Applied Inquiry in Higher Education. From this week, we will discuss how to design your research study, which means developing detailed plans on how you will conduct your empirical research. This week and next week, we will focus on quantitative research design. In this presentation, I will provide a general overview of quantitative research design. In the following presentations, I will address major procedures for data collection, including sampling, data collection method, and questionnaire formation to conduct a quantitative research. For the last two weeks, we have covered the very first two steps in your research proposal, which are introduction, that includes your research topic, problem, purpose, and questions, and literature review to highlight what is known and unknown for your topical area and research questions, as well as why your research is worthy and what contributions your study will make to existing body of literature. The method part is where you describe your research design. Research design should include information on what subjects and setting you want to study and how you will conduct information about them using what kind of instruments and how you will analyze the collected data. Again this week, we focus on quantitative research design. If you remember from what we discussed in the previous week, quantitative research aims to explain variability and or relationships. The approach focuses on testing hypotheses and uses numerical data and statistical analysis. Depending on the types of questions a study investigates, a researcher will employ different quantitative research designs, and those include descriptive, comparative, correlational, experimental, and quasi-experimental designs. First, descriptive research serves the purpose of observing, describing, and documenting aspects of a situation or object as it is. For example, if your research question is to understand how students use their time particularly on social media and study, your research will be a descriptive study. Second, a comparative design is to find differences between two or more groups on one or multiple dimensions. An example would be a study that compares engineering and liberal arts students' time use on Facebook. Compared to the descriptive design in the previous slide, now, the focus of the question is to compare the groups in addition to describing the trend in time use. Meanwhile, you will employ a correlational research design if you want to explain the nature of the relationship between two or more variables. Here, you have to be careful that correlation or association doesn't necessarily translate to causality. As you see in the cartoon at the bottom of this slide, yes, the instance of total cancer increased while number of cell phone users increased. So the two seem to increase together, but this only shows us the association between the two, meaning that as one factor increases, the other tend to increase too. But we do not know if the increased use of cell phone caused incidences of cancer or vice versa, unless we can exclude all other possible factors that are related to both cancer instance and use of cell phone. Going back to our example, you can employ a correlational design if your question is, is there an association between time spent on Facebook and time spent on studying? Although I use the word association to frame my research question, you would sometimes see studies that investigate impact of something using a correlational design. For example, the question can be, does time spent on Facebook influence time spent on studying? However, in this case, you have to acknowledge that you are not making a causal claim, which means what you can draw from your statistical analysis is if students who spend relatively more time on Facebook tend to spend less time on studying or vice versa. But there could be lots of other things that affect both time use on social media and studying, such as other hobbies or motivation for studying. And therefore, we cannot exclusively conclude that more time on Facebook reduces students' studying time. 
To investigate a causal relationship, researchers might employ an experimental design. Basically, experimental design involves creating a treatment or intervention and control groups. And your subject should be randomly distributed either treatment group or control group. The treatment group will only receive intervention that is manipulated in the way that you want to test the effect. Before we look at the example, I would like to note one thing. Although experimental design has been used in many social sciences, it has been not much used in higher education or generally education research. Why do you think that is the case? Experiment on human subjects presents many challenges in procedures as well as ethical problems. So perfect randomization is difficult because what we study is human being and we cannot perfectly control all other conditions but the intervention. Second, the other important point is that in education research, intervention is often related to students' developments or learning outcomes. So giving the benefit to one group but not to the other can be harmful for students' benefit. When students know that only certain groups are receiving treatment that are supposed to be beneficial, for example, additional readings for the treatment group, control group can have an unintended stigma that this selection is due to their lower academic ability and as a consequence, the experimental design can lower control students' outcomes. Or both treatment and control groups might try to comply with what they perceive as the researchers are expecting from them and the study findings are biased. Recently, researchers are employing randomized controlled trial to study the effect of financial aid, teaching method, support programs, and etc. in the context of higher education. We will look at the actual study example in some minutes. Okay, so what if you want to study whether the use of Twitter communication increases students' engagement, i.e. causes a higher level of student engagement? Let's say you will teach Introduction to Higher Education course for 40 students. You can then randomly assign students to intervention and control groups. Before the semester start, you will measure students' engagement level using a test. Then the intervention kicks in. For only intervention group, you will ask them to make 10 tweets per week on the given session's topic. For control group, you will not require anything other than normal class assignments. Seven weeks later, you will measure their level of engagement and compare the changes in engagement for both groups and see if the changes in engagement level were different between the treatment and control groups. Again, conducting an experimental study is not an easy task or even almost impossible for some settings. For example, it is extremely difficult to run an experiment on financial aid for all students in a state or a country. A quasi-experimental research then provides you an opportunity to estimate a causal relationship. How it works is that there will be an external shock such as sudden change to the surrounding environment or external factor that differentiates individual status on the treatment variable. For example, let's hypothesize that our higher education program decides to flip all classes offered at the downtown campus while keeping the same courses as traditional way at the Tempe campus in effective of fall 2016. Then this presents an opportunity to answer the question of does flipped classroom increase student learning outcomes? Again, the change in the program policy in fall 2016 created variation among students in terms of they will receive the intervention flipped classroom. Students who attended downtown courses after fall 2016 will be our treatment group, whereas students who attended Tempe campus, regardless of the timing, as well as downtown students before fall 2016, will serve the comparison group. 
then we will get test scores from each group and compare their test scores to estimate the effect of flipped classroom. Hopefully, this review gave you some understanding of different quantitative research designs. And for your project in this course, given our resources and time, you do not have to do a complicated research such as experimental or quasi-experimental approaches. However, I want you to at least understand the use of each design in relation to the research questions of a study. To do so, in the next couple of slides, I will share some examples from actually published research. The three research projects that I'm introducing here investigate the topic of institutional selectivity and occupation outcomes for college graduates. If you want to read more about those studies, the manuscripts are available on this week's additional resources folder on our course Blackboard shell. First study that myself and colleagues conducted looked at how institutional selectivity is associated with occupational prestige and job satisfaction for people who attended colleges in 1970s, 80s, and 1990s. So the study first described occupational prestige for each selectivity level for each cohort. The table here shows that people who attended most competitive universities have highest occupational prestige compared to lower selectivity institutions. Then we compared if the differences in the outcome by the selectivity groups are really meaningful, and if so, which groups are particularly different. Then the study employed a correlational design to find an answer to the research question, which was to understand if there is a relationship between institutional selectivity and occupational prestige. The authors conducted a regression analysis. We will discuss more details later, so don't worry about it for now. The point is that the analysis was to look at if socioeconomic index, which is an indicator of occupational prestige, is associated with institutional selectivity, controlling for demographic and academic backgrounds of individuals. The study found that people who attended highly selective universities tend to have a higher occupational prestige for the 1970s and 1980s cohorts, but lower prestige for the cohort of 1990s. Again, the authors did not conclude that the institutional selectivity causes higher occupational prestige. Rather, the conclusion was that people who attended higher selectivity level schools tend to have an occupation of higher prestige or vice versa. Now, if you are a researcher and wants to make a stronger causal claim about the connection between institutional selectivity and occupational attainment, you will want to conduct an experimental research However, how do you think we can randomly assign students to different selectivity schools? Deming and his colleagues saw it from a different angle. They investigated if employers are more or less likely to express interest in a job applicant when his or her degree is from institutions of different selectivity. Using an experimental design, this study created fake resumes of people for people who hold bachelor's degree in business, similar in race, gender, work histories, and skills, but are different in terms of types of colleges. Then the researchers applied to actual job openings that require and do not require a bachelor's degree. Then they documented which resume gets called back for the first round interview, which is a proxy for the chances of getting a job. They tested if the chances of getting a callback is related to the type of institution individuals attend, as indicated in this graph. Again, it is impossible to randomly assign students to different selectivity institutions and conduct an experimental research. Hoextra 2009 conducted a quasi-experimental research to get at this limitation. Remember, a quasi-experimental design is possible if there is a factor that introduces differences in the treatment variable across individuals. 
Basically, he argued that SAT scores determine a student's admission to a flagship public university versus non-flagship public university. So he used this as a way to determine who receives the treatment, which is attendance at a flagship university, and who serves as control group, which is not attending at a flagship. You can imagine that if a student made a mistake on SAT and because of that one point, he did not get into a flagship, then his other characteristics would be pretty similar to his peer who scored just slightly higher than the admission cutoff score because he guessed one question and guess what? He got the right answer by chance. So he got into a flagship. So the author compares the outcome, which was um, income in 5 to 10 years from graduation for the people who are just near at the admission cutoff score. And he found a significant effect of graduating from a flagship university on future income. So that was an overview of quantitative research design and some examples from research. During our face-to-face -face class, we will discuss what research design you should use for your own research project. Again, most of your projects will use descriptive, maybe comparative or correlational. However, you have to choose an appropriate research design considering validity, usefulness, and feasibility. Your research design should be suitable for providing answer to your research question you should at least acknowledge potential biases or confounding factors that could distort the research findings. Also, you may consider what outcomes will be generated from your research design and how that is useful for your study and other practical uses. Of course, the design should be something feasible given your resources and time. Again, I will finish this presentation with the note that your research question and design should go hand in hand. In addition, when you investigate the relationships between factors, be careful not to make any claims beyond what you are estimating, particularly in terms of causal conclusions.